look. This beauty, it is warm. Fresh air lifts the spirits. The Lofoten Archipelago in Norway's Arctic Circle. Below us, fish. Millions of fish. A wealth of fish. Enjoying the warm waters of the Gulf Stream. Below the fish, the ground, the seabed. Below the seabed, petroleum. The fisherman explains. The offshore drilling for petroleum creates ecological devastation locally. Permanent devastation. Its effects on the fish populations cannot be predicted. And that's without the always existing risk of an oil spill. The daily routine of oil production itself does enough damage. This is what happens. Drilling requires water to be pumped down to the seabed and then the polluted water is drained out in the sea without having been cleaned. The effects of this toxic and radioactive material, yes, there is natural radioactivity in the ground, this poison that comes up with the spill water will have negative effects on one of the cleanest waters in the world and the fish grounds. What's more, the pressure and the noise of the drilling will frighten the fish and disorientate the cod, which would have to pass through the oil rigs on their migration routes. The oil producer asserts, we will extract millions of barrels of petroleum. It will make us rich, much richer. We are living in uncertain times. The economy is in crisis. What oil will give us is certainty. Certainty. The certainty of a steady income. The certainty that cars will carry on driving. The certainty that planes will carry on flying. The certainty that what we buy will be shipped around the globe to us. The certainty of more carbon emissions. The certainty of global warming the certainty of fossilized capitalism, the certainty that planetary tipping points are close when global warming becomes self-perpetuating and impossible to reverse, the certainty that the weather will be uncertain. Darling, how is the weather today? It's so cold, even politicians have their hands in their own pockets. Politicians have barely begun to consider climate protection as important. After all, one must learn that climate protection is a very relative thing. It must be compatible with economic growth. Otherwise, it will not take place. Every state tries to impose the costs of climate protection onto others. Every state tries to assure itself that profit can be made from climate protection. Climate change is likely to be the straw that broke the camel's back for states and regions that are already fragile and conflict prone. A toxic mix of poverty, violence and climate change leads to massive dislocation. The social consequences of climate change are already upon us, showing themselves with the footprints poverty and violence, colonialism and neoliberal policies have left behind. Fundamentalist policies of privatization and economic deregulation enforced by the International Monetary Fund and World Bank have pushed many economies in the global south from one crisis to another and created fatal inequalities. <laughs> A 
a Molotov cocktail of political, economic and environmental disasters, one amplifying the other. The United Nations has estimated that all but one of its emergency appeals for humanitarian aid in 2007 were climate-related. Already now, climate change adversely affects 300 million people per year, killing 300,000 of them. An estimated 50 million people have already been displaced by the effects of climate change, and the numbers will escalate in years to come. A study from Columbia University's Center for International Earth Science Information Network projects 700 million climate refugees will be on the move by 2050. Climate change acts as one more reason for people to migrate. As they move, they will be faced by fortress walls built by the wealthy economies and armed with cameras, listening devices and stun guns. In some areas, people have no choice but to compete for water and grazing. Countries such as Kenya are receiving greater amounts of precipitation. But the rain comes in sudden bursts, violent downpours, all at once, rather than gradually over a season. Floods that strip away topsoil, followed by drought. Floods and drought, floods and drought. Drought. That's why small farmers in the global south get into debt. They take a loan to dig deeper wells, or build irrigation systems or plant other seeds, which very often do not pay back the money they could only borrow at inflated interest rates. Weather joins the chaos, unfree market chaos, with unprecedented temperatures and unprecedented rains. Climate refugees, displaced farmers, subject to victim blame, have no choice but to make for the city. Cities become megacity chaos. The climate system is too complex for facile theorizing, as if a weather event had a single cause. But the trends are all in the same direction. As atmospheric carbon dioxide rises, average temperatures increase, and weather joins the chaos to make more chaos of its own. In the global south, many states have been reduced to a hollow shell. Their powers and budgets taken away, then victim blamed as failed states by those who took them. The global south that historically has the least responsibility for global warming, now without the capacity to deal with its effects. All across the planet, extreme weather and water scarcity inflame and escalate existing social conflicts left in their wake by the global grabbers. When rainfall is significantly below normal, the risk of a low-level conflict escalating to a full-scale civil war doubles. Governments in the north have started to imagine a militarized geography of social breakdown on a global scale, containing and policing those failed states whose failure they created is at the center of the project. The United States military take global warming more seriously than any other institution. In May 2013, US President Obama declared that the so-called war on terror will continue. A permanent war, an endless war, 
without geographical limits and without any conceptual constraints. Open-ended counterinsurgency, militarized borders, aggressive anti-immigrant policing, worldwide surveillance of all means of communication, authoritarianism, the new normal, for disaster capitalism. Disaster. Disasters. In the moment of disaster, the old orders are lost, deaf and dumb for all to see. People improvise, make rescues, shelters, put together collectives. In disaster, people come together. The collective possibility, not the mob, as politicians and media want us to believe. People coming together make transformations, whether good and bad, depending on not greed, not fear. We cannot welcome disaster, say hello with a naive smile, but we can seize the moment, construct glimpses of utopia, analogues to our future in the past. Paris Commune, 1871. When the state breaks down. Workers' collectives during the Spanish Civil War. Opening a box of possible futures. Collective information. Collective intelligence. Collective improvisation. Collective audacity. Collective decision-making. Feel your power. Don't consume history. Make it. Disasters often unfold as though a revolution has already taken place. Disruptive climate change is a certainty. Even if we manage the economic shift away from fossil fuel fundamentalism in the next few years, radical emissions reduction needs to start immediately. Demystifying the economy. Decarbonizing the economy. Democratizing the economy. Decolonializing the economy. Decapitalizing the economy. Audacity to expropriate the private wealth planners, to take back from the grabbers, to shred the unfree market mantras that dominate the world. The rise in emissions from goods produced in the global south, shipped in giant diesel-burning container ships across the oceans to be consumed in the north is six times greater than the emissions savings in the north. Do not expect your politicians to make these decisions on your behalf. After years of recycling, carbon offsetting and light bulb changing, it is obvious. Individual action just doesn't do the job when it comes to climate crisis. Only collective action will do. Disputed, maybe. Political by necessity. for a post-oil world. The cleanest oil is what you leave in the ground. The climate crisis is not a technical problem. The climate crisis is a political problem. Demand nothing. Act yourself. Act collectively. Think the impossible. Raise your voice. Shut down. Why not? The good.
good life.